Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk on blockchain internals. My name is Stephen Haunts. So I want to get started by starting off with a little story. So imagine you're a developer sitting at your desk, diligently working away on some code, probably the best code you've ever written. All of a sudden, the project manager taps you on the shoulder. Uh-oh. This can only mean bad things. He asks you to come to the boardroom. So off you go to the boardroom, and who's in there but the CEO wearing his nice suit. Beads of sweat start running down your forehead. This is never good when the CEO's in the boardroom. He locks his eyes on you like a cheetah about to attack a gazelle. And then he says, we need a blockchain. <sighs> Who's let him loose on the internet again? So this talk is kind of to talk a little bit about how some of the underlying principles of blockchain work. I'm not covering any particular platforms like Ethereum or anything like that. We're talking about more you know, computer science level algorithms and data structures. But it's to arm you with a bit of information so that you know, if you're in that situation, and I've been in that situation where I've had a CEO say he wants a blockchain, then you know, you'll be a bit more armed with some more knowledge about it. So as I said, this is going to be more platform neutral, so it's more about algorithms and data structures to arm you with those basic principles. So first of all, I want to talk a bit about trust. So, you know, we live in the golden age of the internet. You know, many of us have probably grown up when we were kids when the internet first came around for our use. So it's been kind of exciting, the, the amount of technology that we've got. But one of the things that we lack on the internet is trust between multiple parties. I mean, we can communicate, but getting trust between lots of different people is very difficult to do. You know, and a good example um, around trust is how we sort of rely on big monolithic organizations like banks. So a bank is a large monolith, and as individuals we trust them to look after our money and hope that they don't do anything wrong. But sometimes things do go wrong. So an example, a large bank in the UK, I won't, I won't name them, but they outsourced some of their um, software development, they went to do a deployment, and completely screwed up transaction processing on statements. The reason I mention it is because I was affected by it, so my statements were completely out of whack for about seven days. So things do go wrong. One of the antidotes that we've got towards this are things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So who here owns Bitcoin or any kind of cryptocurrency? A fair few of you. I hope you managed to uh, invest wisely before it crashed the other year. But Bitcoin is part of this sort of antidote. It's a decentralized um, way of gaining trust in the financial system. And you know, we can use Bitcoins for buying and selling and pretty much doing anything these days. I mean, you can even get vending machines where you scan your, your wallet ID and you can buy a candy bar. Now, Bitcoin was invented by someone called Satoshi Nakamoto. Well, we think it's one person. It could be multiple. Nobody really knows who he or she is. But back in 2008, there was a, pub, a paper published um, at Bitcoin.org. It's quite an interesting paper if you've not read it. But this talk isn't about Bitcoin. So what I want to talk about today is more of the underlying principles of a blockchain, which is what a, the Bitcoin is built on. So that's, that's a bit of a bit of a dig at the uh, <laughs> at the current Bitcoin prices. So what I want to do is I want to talk about blockchain, so not Bitcoin specifically. So this is more about kind of you know how can we leverage blockchain technologies within our organisations, if indeed that is the right thing to do. So first of all, I want to look at a couple of definitions. So the first is by Don and Alex Tapscott, the author of a very good book called Blockchain Revolution. Highly recommend reading it if you're interested in this subject. In that book, they say, a blockchain is an incorruptible digital ledger of economic transactions that can be programmed to record not just financial transactions, but virtually everything of value. So that's kind of a nice you know, definition of what a blockchain is. And if we go to our good friend Wikipedia, it has a more sort of technical definition. A blockchain is a continuously growing list of records called blocks, which are linked and secured using cryptography. Uh, so if we pull out some of the key phrases from those two definitions, so we've got digital ledger, continuously growing list of records, that's incorruptible, and linked and secured using cryptography. So that is effectively what we're, what we're dealing with, an incorruptible ledger, which is a continuously growing list of records, linked and secured using cryptography. So essentially we have something like this. So we have a block, hence why it's called a blockchain. A block contains multiple transactions that are all hashed together. This is where we, you know, we hear the concept of mining, which is why NVIDIA has done so well over the last 10 years. And then we get those blocks and we link them together. Now with something like Bitcoin, it generally takes on average about 10 minutes for one of those um, blocks to be mined. 
or for them to find the hashing puzzle, which we'll talk about a bit later. So if we assume it takes 10 minutes to calculate each block, and if we imagine we have a 1,000 blocks in our chain, just because I'm not very good at maths, that means it takes 166 hours to recalculate the chain, which is nearly seven days to recalculate the entire chain. So if you go back to the first block and modify some of the data, it's going to take you seven days to recalculate that entire chain. Now if we look at the blockchain, so this is a website called blockchain.info, which is where you can actually go and look at the Bitcoin blockchain. At the time I took this screenshot, there was 514,802 blocks in that chain, which is means to recalculate the entire chain from the Genesis block right the way through to that block, you're looking at 85,800 hours, 3,575 days, or nearly 10 years. So this is sort of one of the powerful things about blockchain, is that the blocks are very hard to calculate, but once you've calculated them, they're very easy to verify, which we'll look at in a bit. So that's great. But going back to our CEO in the boardroom, so one of the questions we really need to answer is, do you actually need a blockchain? Because like everything else in our software developer toolkit, it's a tool. It's got some uses. It's good for some things. It's not good for others. So we need to kind of understand where this actually fits in the software development and the organizational life cycle of our companies. So when I've done consulting with organizations before who have you know, asked this question, do we need a blockchain? There's a simple matrix of questions that we run through. Now, typically, this will be done over the space of a week, and there's lots of discussion. But we're just going to go through them very quickly here. So the first one is, do you need a shared public database? So if you're using a public blockchain, all your data is going to be shared between lots of different miners on the network. Are you happy for that data to be out in the public? If the answer is no, blockchain is probably not going to be very useful to you. Are there multiple parties involved? So in the case of Bitcoin, you've got lots of different people transacting between each other. There are lots of different parties. You could have different banks wanting to form a blockchain consortium. But if there's not lots of parties involved, then again, a database would probably be more sufficient for your needs. Do these parties have conflicting interests or are not trusted? If it's different organizations, then obviously you've got you know, industry competition between different companies, so that might mean that a blockchain could be useful. But if not, then again, you're probably not going to need one. Are all the parties able to play by the same rules? So if you think of all the miners in a Bitcoin network, they're all using exactly the same rules to mine and process transactions. So if all of the parties in your consortium of people using a blockchain can't agree to the same rules, which, you know, imagine trying to get a whole load of banks to agree to the same rule sheet, that's going to be quite difficult. So again, a blockchain might not be the best solution for you. Do you need an immutable log of all transactions to be recorded? I mean, effectively, the transactions that we're putting into a blockchain are kind of like time series events. It's something that happened on a particular time. It could be the monetary transfer, you know, a value of money. It could be an insurance claim settlement. It could be... Um, some anti-money laundering details that have been registered at a certain point in time. If that's what you want, then yeah, a blockchain is probably going to be suitable. If not, then probably you're just going to need a, a normal database. Do the transaction rules change frequently? So again, to make something like a blockchain beneficial, you need all of your rules on how you handle transactions to remain relatively static or not change too frequently. If you answered yes to all of those, then yeah, maybe a blockchain might be interesting to look at. So then you've got to decide whether you want a public blockchain or a private one, which we'll talk about in a moment. So why would you use a blockchain over a database? Well, it gives you decentralized trust. Now, the whole point of Bitcoin, for example, is you've got loads of miners mining blocks, verifying blocks, using consensus algorithms, making sure that everyone is kept in check. So if someone tries to fraudulently change a transaction somewhere, the rest of the network is going to detect it and reject it. A blockchain is immutable. Once data is on there, you can't change it. It's eventually consistent. So as you said, when you try to mine a block, it could take you know 10 minutes in Bitcoin, using Bitcoin as an example. So your data is not necessarily going to get committed to a chain event uh, immediately. It will be eventual. Uh, you get data integrity. And also, one thing we can't really cover today, but Things like Ethereum give you ability to run smart contracts, which effectively turns the Bitcoin network into a large planetary scale distributed computer, which means you can execute code as a transaction, which is quite cool. So why do you want to use a database over a blockchain? Well, databases, you know, they give us very fast storage. They're generally very fast these days, whether you're using SQL Server or Oracle or any of the fancy NoSQL databases. Replication is generally quite easy to set up and use. 
They're easy to manage and well understood. They've been around for a long time. They're not as computationally expensive, so we haven't got any of this complex mining going on. It's very easy to amend or delete data, because it's a database. And there's no per transaction cost like you get with something like Bitcoin or blockchain. Because if you're going to have multiple miners all trying to mine blocks publicly, they want to be paid and compensated for the electricity they're using. So we talked a little bit about public and private blockchains. So with a public blockchain, this means that literally anyone can write to that blockchain. So if you think in terms of Bitcoin, you can have miners. How many, how many people here have run mining rigs before? Just out of interest. A few. So, I mean, you can have people in Sweden doing it, you can have people in the US doing it, UK, Australia, North Korea, Iraq, France, literally anywhere. So, generally, every node contains a complete copy of the chain. So, everyone participating in that network is going to have a complete copy of the blockchain available to them. And a public blockchain really gives you the best security between peers. But the hashing puzzles are time consuming to calculate, as we'll demonstrate a little bit later on. Now, because of this, some enterprises are you know, quite rightly nervous about the idea behind public blockchains. You know, putting data out in the public kind of gives them the heebie-jeebies a bit, especially if we're in a regulated environment like financial services or healthcare, which is why we have things like private um, blockchains. So instead of it being completely open to the public, you can have like a smaller consortium of known trusted individuals you might want to participate in that network. And they've been a bit controversial, so blockchain and Bitcoin purists would argue that these things should never exist because you're not getting the full distributed trust of a public blockchain. But the actual reality is, if organizations are going to start adopting things like this, then private blockchains are here to stay. So in this, typically, an enterprise will write and verify transactions. So you might have a load of banks all writing transactions. I'm going to use an example of an insurance company in a little bit. So it doesn't have that same level of decentralized trust that you get with a public blockchain. So lots of different use cases around blockchains that are being explored in a minute. So the one that we all know is digital currencies. You know, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogecoin, Ethereum, and about another 30,000 different types of coins that are out there. There's a lot of companies investing time into trying to develop voting systems. So taking out the complexity of manual voting in elections. So you have a mobile phone which is unique to you. You use that to vote. They can check that you've only voted once and then be able to instantly count the votes but you can't then go back in and sort of fraudulently change votes because it's been entered into the blockchain. So there's lots of investment around that in a minute. People are using blockchains to register intellectual property, so copyright and patent details. Anti-money laundering and know your customer checks. So as companies or financial companies do fraud checks against you, they could write that into a blockchain which is accessed by other banks so they can all access the same fraud checking information. Identity management are ways of recording identities of people. And also public registries. So, for example, in the UK, we have a public land registry. So when you buy a property, details of your ownership go onto the public land registry. So there's lots of work around putting those sorts of things onto blockchains as well. But you have to be very careful with what you put on a blockchain because of our good friend GDPR. So GDPR basically means as a customer or consumer, you own your data. The, co the company doesn't own it, they're just custodians of that data. So you own your data, which means you have the right to have your data amended. So if you want to change your name for a company, that's your right to do so. But you also have the right to be forgotten as well. So if you want your data deleted, that's your right to do so. That's a bit of a problem on a blockchain because you can't change data that's already on there and you can't go and delete it because it's an immutable ledger. Now, to my knowledge, I don't think there's been any examples of litigation around this yet, but it's only a matter of time before something like that happens, which will be quite interesting to see, provided I'm not involved. So GDPR, something you need to be very careful of, so you don't want to go putting people's personal information onto a blockchain because you can't change it. Okay, so the fundamental crypto protocols that we want to look at for this are hashing. You can use cryptography and digital signatures as well for more advanced stuff, but we're just going to focus on the hashing part today. So a hashing algorithm is quite a simple concept. So you have a piece of data. It could be a PDF file. It could be an image, you know, any piece of digital data. Pass it into a hashing function, and then you get a big, long sequence of characters or data out the back. Now, that data is kind of like a unique fingerprint for that piece of data. Now, a good hashing algorithm should have four properties. 
So it should be easy to compute the hash value. So as I said, you have your data, run it through the hashing function, you get your hash code out the other side. It should be easy. It should be infeasible to generate a hash, or it should be infeasible to generate a message that has a given hash. So you shouldn't be able to say, you know, what data do I need to generate this specific hash code? You shouldn't be able to predict what that data is going to be. It should be infeasible to modify a message without changing the hash. So if you've got a PDF document that's, say, a contract, and you change one character in that contract, or even just one bit in a byte, you'd expect that hash code to be completely different when you recalculate it. Not just a little bit different, but completely different. And it should also be infeasible to find two different hashes or two different pieces of data that have the same hash. That's called a hash collision. So older algorithms like MD5 have had that problem where you can actually get hash collisions. But generally, that's not a property that you want. So hashing is a one-way operation. As you said, you have your data, generate the hash, get your hash code. But you can't then go back and derive what that original piece of data was. Whereas conversely with encryption, so if you think of symmetric encryption, you have some data, you encrypt it with a key, but you can then decrypt it with that same key and get your data back. But hashing is just one way. So these days in modern cipher suites, we've got lots of different options available to us, but commonly we've got the secure hash protocol. So SHA-1, which is a 20-byte, 160-bit hash. We've got SHA-2, which can be 256 bits or 512 bits. And then we've got the new SHA-3. OK, so let's dive into some details. So I'm going to use a small example. And that example is an insurance company. So in our little example here, we've got a whole band of insurance companies all joining together. And they want to have a blockchain, a private blockchain between them all. So whenever a customer or a claimant settles a claim on their car, that gets entered into a blockchain, which means the benefit for them is if I settle a claim for my car with one insurance company, and then I try and settle it with another insurance company, they can immediately check whether I'm trying to do a duplicate claim, which you shouldn't be able to do. So that's the example. So when they write their transaction into a block, they want to have the claim number, so that identifies the claim back in their core platform. A settlement amount, so how much am I being paid? The settlement date, which is when the settlement was made. The car registration plate, the mileage on the car, and then the claim type. So claim type, for sake of example, will just say it's total loss. So you've wrapped your car around a lamppost, it's been written off, you want to be paid for that car. So let's look at a very simple example. So we'll have a block with just a single transaction in it. We'll start there. So this is what our block looks like. So we have our transaction details, which is what we've just covered. So claim number, settlement amount, date, registration plate, mileage, and claim type. And then we have a block header down the bottom here. So this contains the block hash, which is the hash code we're about to calculate. A block number, so that's a number of the block in the chain. Starts at zero. That's typically called the genesis block. We have the date in which that block was created. We have the previous block hash, so that's the hash from the block before it. And then we just have a link or something going to the next block. So to calculate our block hash, we take our transaction details, so our insurance claim details. We concatenate that with the block number, the creation date, and the hash from the previous block, if one exists. Run it through a hash function, SHA-256 for sake of argument and then the hash code we write back into the block hash. So if we imagine we've got three blocks, so block zero, now the previous block hash there is null because there isn't a block before it. We then have the second block, block one, which has a link to the previous block hash included in it, and then uh, the second, sorry, the third block, block number two. Damn, I've ruined the uh, punchline for that bit. I was about to say, does anyone know what data structure for computer sciences resembles? Did anyone not see the slide? <laughs> so effectively, we're looking at a linked list or a double linked list. So all this investment that's going into Bitcoin and blockchains at the minute, they're effectively throwing money at linked lists. Which is great. I want to do something with a balanced tree next. So if we look at the scenario where we want to verify the block or the, the chain is accurate and hasn't been tampered with. So what we do is we start off with our first block and we recalculate the block hash. So we take the claim number or the transaction details, 
block number, the creation date, and the previous block hash. We hash them together and recalculate that hash, and then we compare it to the hash that we've already got stored. If it matches, great. We're confident that nothing's been changed in that block. So we then move on to the next block. So here again, we take the transaction details, the block hash, the creation date, and the previous block hash. So we're taking that hash here and including it in our hash for this block. Recalculate it, compare it to what we've got stored. If it matches, great, nothing's changed. And we do the same for the third block. So that's a happy path. So now let's imagine some dodgy person has come along and they've changed the settlement amount in the first block. They've changed it from, say, 5,000 euros to 10,000 euros. You know, they're trying to hack the data back into there. So we recalculate the block hash by concatenating the transaction details with the block number, the creation date, and the previous block hash. Recalculate it, compare it to what's stored, but it doesn't match because someone's changed that data in the transaction. So that's not good. We've got a problem. OK, well, let's move on to the next block. So we take that previous block hash that we've just recalculated and pass that into the next block. Recalculate the block hash with the transaction details and the block header data. We compare that hash to what we've got stored. Again, it doesn't match because there was a problem with the previous block hash and so on. So what we actually seen then is because there's a, an issue in the first block, it's actually created a cascading series of failures down the blockchain because we're passing that previous block hash to the next block every time. So if we had a thousand blocks and someone went in and changed block 500, the data in there, the first 500 blocks would all verify OK. But as soon as we get to 500 and then 501 and so on, we'll see that they'd all start failing the verification. Everyone with me so far? The one that we just recalculated. So when the block was originally created, we create the, the block hash and we store it in the block. When we go to verify the block, we're recreating a new block hash, but we're not storing it over the top of the old one. We're just using it to check. OK, so a, a more realistic example then is that we would have multiple transactions within our block. So if we go and look at a block in Bitcoin, for example, we can see at the top there that the number of transactions in their block, in this example, is 604. So that's 604 records of people transferring you know, Bitcoins between each other. So that would give us something like this. So we have, instead of just one transaction, we might have, say, six transactions, just to keep the slide simple. So what we could do is we could get all those transaction details, we could concatenate them all together, then add in the block number, creation date, and previous block hash, recalculate the hash, and then just store it as we did before. But there's actually a more efficient data structure for representing the multiple blocks in the, in the uh, block. And that's called a Merkle tree. Has anyone done Merkle trees at university? I saw one hand. <laughs> OK. We're all going to learn something. So a Merkle tree is a very simple data structure. Conceptually, it's very simple. So imagine we've got four transactions. So transaction one, two, three, and four. Now what we do is we take transactions one and two. So first of all, we hash each of the transactions. So each of these boxes has a hash for that transaction. Then what we do is we take transactions one and two, and we get their hash codes, add them together, and then rehash them. So the hash stored in here is actually a hash of those two hashes. We've got all the hash. Then what we do is we take the hash codes from hash 1, 2 and hash 3, 4, concatenate those together and rehash them, and that gives us a single hash at the top of the tree, which represents all of the other data in that tree. And we call that the Merkle root. This is an, gives us an interesting property in computer science, which is kind of why they were invented. They weren't invented for bitcoins. They were around way longer before that. But imagine if we change the data in transaction 1 and we wanted to recalculate the Merkle root. We haven't got to recalculate every single hash. All we need to do is recalculate the hash for transaction one. Because that's changed, we recalculate the hash one, two in the middle there, and then we recalculate the Merkle root. Again, for example, if we went and changed transaction three, in this case, then we'd only need to recalculate hash three, four, and then the Merkle root. 
Now, if you imagine you've got 600 transactions at the bottom there, that's going to be a pretty big tree. So it's just a way of efficiently representing the data in a tree, but if you change some of that data, it's more efficient to get back to the Merkle reads instead of having to recalculate everything. That's kind of why they were originally, originally invented. So let's equate it back to our example. So we've got four transactions here. We, first of all, we calculate the Merkle root, which is that bit there. At this point, it's just a single hash, just like what we've been dealing with previously. So once we've done all the Merkle tree bit, once we get to this bit, the rest of it is exactly the same as what we did before. So we take that hash, pass it into the hash function. We take the block number, creation date, and previous block hash, hash them together, and stick it in the block hash. So that's the same as what we did before. So again, if we go back and look at an example from Bitcoin, at the, the website blockchain.info, you can see that they have their Merkle root there. So what that means is you know, they've created this big tree, they've hashed everything together, and they've got the single hash at the end. So that's what that represents. OK. To create a hash in something like Bitcoin or Ethereum, there's a process that you go through for each block. And there's, dif there's different ways of doing it, but the most common one at the moment is called proof of work. And this is what you get mining rigs set up for. So people are trying to solve the proof of work puzzle per block. And what this means is that each node on the network, when they have a whole bunch of transactions, they're all racing to solve a particular puzzle. Now again, if we look at blockchain.info, if you look at the hash at the top there, or if I zoom into it, you'll notice it's got a whole bunch of zeros at the beginning of it, 18 zeros in this case. So what they're trying to do is that they're not just going to hash the transactions like we did in our previous example. What they're trying to do is they're trying to solve a puzzle where they end up with a hash that has a, a fixed number of zeros at the beginning of it. Or in other words, they're trying to generate a hash that's below a certain number. Now that's very hard to do. I'll give you an example why. So let's imagine, set blockchains aside, we just have a simple message. Attack at 6 a.m. Tuesday. And we have a number appended to it. And when we, cr when we do that hash, we get a hash code here with six zeros at the beginning of it. So if we, w if we were to work through that as a process, we start off, you know, attack at 6 a.m. Tuesday, and that number's zero. We create the hash. Do we have the desired number of zeros at the beginning of the hash? No, we don't. So we increase that number to one. Okay, in this example, we've been lucky, and it's given us one zero at the beginning, but it's not the number of zeros that we want. So we carry on, and we keep on going through that counter, until we get the desired outcome. That takes a long time to do. But GPUs are really efficient at doing it, which is why people buy lots of GPUs and set up mining rigs. All the mining rig is trying to do is it's trying to work out what that number is to give them a hash with a fixed number of zeros at the beginning. That is literally all it's doing. NVIDIA are rubbing their hands with joy at, at this. So in case of Bitcoin, to relate it back to something that we all know, at the time I took this slide, the number of zeros they were looking for was 18. Now if you're trying to do that on a, on a normal CPU, you just probably would never be able to work it out, which is why we have warehouses full of GPUs trying to do this. So in this example, that's the, that's the nonce down there. That's the counter that they had to count to to get to that hash. Now imagine you've done all that work and you found the hash, and then someone goes and changes just one of the details in one of the transactions. That number is going to be completely wrong. So if you recalculate the hash, you'll probably just get a normal hash with no zeros at the beginning. So if you change any of the data in that transaction, you've got to go through that entire process again. So that means it's expensive to calculate, but it's easy to verify. Once you know that number, it's very easy to actually sort of check the hash. So making the so it makes the uh, blockchain very easy to verify, but to actually change any of the block details, it's very expensive to do because you've got to go through that counter to try and work out that number. Okay, so if we look at example here, so we've got three blocks. Each one takes 10 minutes. So if I change some data in one of the transactions in that first block, it will take me 10 minutes to calculate the block hash for that one. Once I've done that, I you know, it takes 10 minutes to calculate the next one, and then so on. So in this example, if I change some data here, 
if I change the settlement amount for 5,000 euros to 10,000 euros, it's going to take half an hour, theoretically, to recalculate all of those blocks for it to balance. Or, you know, 5,000 blocks, 833 hours or 35 days. So how do we integrate proof of work into the example we've just discussed? Well, actually, it's very easy. So now this is what we had previously. You know, we're passing the Merkle root into our hashing function with the details from the block header. But what we do now is we add an additional uh, value, the nonce, the number once, as it's referred to. And then we just repeat that hash you know, multiple times, including the nonce in the hash. When we get the hash with the desired number of zeros at the beginning, we're done, and we then write it into the block hash. So for a bit of fun, I created a little C sharp program just to just to do this. Now it's, it's a crap piece of code. It's not using a GPU, it's just CPU bound. But it's just to illustrate the purpose. So I set the difficulty level to zero, i.e. I want one zero at the beginning. And that was you know pretty instant. You know, the nonce count was zero. I set it to level one, and that took twenty four iterations to to give me just one zero at the beginning for this particular example. Then I set the level to two. And that took 9,478 iterations to get two zeros at the beginning. Three zeros took 93,521 iterations. Four took, is that 200 and, no, can't see it properly from there. 2,286,428. Six, sorry, five took that number. I'm not going to try and read it out. I left my laptop on overnight to try and get to six. I left my laptop on overnight to try and get to six. I left it going for 12 hours and then gave up, just turned it off. It's a crap example because it was all done on the CPU, so it wasn't using a GPU. But I, I did it just to create that slide, just so that we could actually sort of see, you know, by adding a, an extra zero to that hash, sort of the level of complexity that's involved to calculate it. Okay. So in summary. This is what a blockchain is. It's an incorruptible digital ledger of continuously growing records linked and secured using cryptography. So that, at the fundamental basis is what a blockchain is. Blocks contain multiple transactions that are hashed together, and then they are put together into what looks like a linked list. So if you're going for any investment for, for a blockchain business, you can sit there smiling, thinking that you're looking for millions of you know, dollars for a linked list. Fundamental principle is quite simple when we boil it down. So we have our transaction details that are hashed together with some details from the block header. So the block number, creation date, and the previous block hash. That gives us our block hash. But more realistic is we want to have multiple transactions per block, which is kind of what you know Ethereum and uh, Bitcoin do. To store those blocks in the hash, we use a Merkle tree, just because it's a more efficient way of calculating block hashes. Then that Merkle root is included in the hash code, along with the block header details. The proof of work algorithm very basically just you know it in increases a counter, trying to find a hash with a set number of zeros at the beginning of it, and that's what makes the mining process complex. So you imagine you've got thousands of you know nodes around the world all trying to compete to create that block hash, and then someone gets it and goes, I've won, and then they pass their block out to everyone else, and then they get paid their mining reward. That's, that's why people do it. They're trying to get the mining reward. And that's it. That's about all I've got time for today. Um, my name's Stephen Haunts. I run a training company called Stephen Haunts Training. I also uh, write courses for Pluralsight. Does anyone here use Pluralsight? Cool. Loads of you. Excellent. Because I've only had 40 minutes, I've obviously not been able to go into the level of detail which I'd like to have gone into. But if you are interested in learning more, I've got a course called Blockchain Principles and Practices on Pluralsight. It goes into a lot more detail than what we've talked about today, so it's, you know, it's nearly three hours long. But what I do in that course is I build up a working blockchain example from in C Sharp from scratch. And you can actually follow through the course and sort of play around with the code. So if you really want to understand the principles behind a lot of these technologies, by the end of that course, you have a complete working .NET Core example that builds up a blockchain with Merkle trees and proof of work.
So it's kind of fun to play around with. But I think it is. I might be on my own there. Uh, just quickly, I write lots of books to help software developers and professionals improve their skills. Um, I've done nine so far, there's just a few of them there. And I've also got a book with A-Press coming out early next year on cryptography in .NET. Last slide, I promise. I also run a podcast called the Side Hustle Success Podcast. It's to help people who want to set up businesses. You know, everyone has that kind of dream of you know, building their own product and then taking it full time one day. So I've done that and my co-host has done that and we talk about our experiences and the, the problems that we found along the way. So it's completely free. You can find it on iTunes and Spotify and Stitcher, etc. And that's it. Thank you very much.